April 10th, 1922. If I remember it correctly, it was 600 block of South Washington. There's a um, factory on the site right now. And my father sold the property and moved up to up to Walnut Street, I believe it was. And he had his barrel yard up there. The first 13 years of my life, I lived on South Washington Avenue address. And then we moved up to 521 North Irving Avenue. The following year, that was night, we moved up 1935. The following year, 1936, we moved to 527 North Irving Avenue. Why, I don't know. And that is the homestead as of today, yep. which unfortunately <clears throat> I can no longer support or maintain it. And I had to put it on the market. Uh, I believe Eric is taking care of that as of, I think he put it as of July of this year, he put it on the market to sell. Same house, same bedroom, the middle bedroom on the second floor. And you know, I grew up very fond of the house. In fact, they literally had to drag me out there. I didn't want to sell it. So, when it happens, I realize I can't, can't maintain it anymore. I couldn't even cut the grass. When in my younger days, I used to cut the grass on both sides, both houses. Because my neighbor on the left was an older woman, like, and uh, I used to cut her grass. And while I was at it, I cut it on the other. I had one sister, Helen, and then I had my brother, uh, Henry, Monroe, Harry, and David, and I'm the baby. And uh, that's all. I'm the last one in the family. At one time, I would say, <clears throat> we had, I had, because of the size of my mother, and father's family, I had about, oh, between 50 and 60 first cousins. And uh, there was no such thing as going to a hotel or, or a motel. I remember going to my aunt's house and literally sleeping on the floor because we were stacked <laughs> whenever we went there. And, and, uh, I had a good childhood. Uh, we were never wealthy as such. My father made a good living. And um, I would say that I literally had anything I wanted. I had my first car, I'd say I was, six, I was 16 years old. My father. <clears throat> and then I almost killed my sister. When I went into the Army in 1942, I should say I went into the Air Force, drafted, and I put the car in the garage. It was a 1940 Plymouth, which again, the, the price in those days were, I believe, was $460, something like that. Uh, she thought I would never use it again. Uh, she sold it for $1,000 in 1944, 94, I almost killed her. Because <laughs> when I got out of the service uh, back in uh, 1946, I was in the service from 1942 to 46. You couldn't buy a car. 
so I was stuck. I don't think I purchased a car after the war, 1947 or 1948. He was a, a what they call Cooper, Jabal man, back in the 20s, 30s. Uh, they used wooden barrels for everything, for preservatives, for wine, uh, store things. Of course, now everything is uh, either plastic or steel. And uh, he bought them, repaired them, sold them. It was cooperage business and he made a good living of it. Uh, after he passed away, my brother Harry had the business, and now Harry's grandson, which is Eric, has the business. My father was born in Cotin, C-H-O-T-I-N, Romania. And what he told me, my mother told me, my mother was born in St. John. They never knew whether they were in Romania or Russia because the water was flexible and there were so much wars, so many wars, uh, that they didn't know who, who they were paying the taxes to. And uh, my father, didn't tell me too many stories about the old country. My mother mentioned quite a number of them, of the stories. It was, um, they never, or I should say she, never traveled more than 10 or 15 miles outside of the town. Back in the old, of course, everything was either you walk or you took a wagon. We were talking, um, let's see. My mother came over in the early 1900s, 1905, 1906. I'm not sure exactly when. I have, like I said, I, I have if I could ever find them. I should have looked for them, but uh, when they came over, uh, my mother, or my grandmother, I know, came over in 1920. My mother and father, my father came over, I think, before the turn of the century. And I'm talking about the 20th century, last century. They left mainly discrimination against the Jewish people, I would say. Maybe that sounds cold or I'm beating a dead horse or whatever you want to call it. But there were programs, if I'm pronouncing it right, or pronouncing it right uh, constantly fighting constantly, and my father, brother, the name was Davis, D-A-V-I-S, he came over, oh, about 1880, 18, between 1870 and 1880, and he wrote about the difference of life, no wars, that is internally, uh, he lived in Brooklyn, New York, and New York City is very cosmopolitan. There was no discrimination, uh, plenty of, of freedom, do what you want, you work where you want to. So he must have, I'm just assuming this, he must have written back told my father this thing, told my mother these things. 
Uh, my father and mother were related, but back in the old country, from what I understand, uh, there was a lot of intermarriage of relations. And that's the main reason, what was told to me, why they came over. Get away from discrimination programs and um, just a better life. My father, according to that, came over as Nachman Nathan, which must have been a, Nachman must have been a Russian name or Romanian name. The Weinberg. I really don't know, or I can't remember exactly what his Romanian name was. It must have been something unpronounceable to us because, as I mentioned, his, I think he had four or five brothers, if I remember correctly. Each one seemed to have a different name. Uh, and the reason that they told me this, a cousin or a friend, I'm not sure which, again, this is debatable. I think it was a cousin by name of Avram, which is Abraham in English, Avram Weinberg, met him at Ellis Island because he needed a sponsor to get in to this uh, country. And when they asked my father his name, well, naturally at that moment in time, he didn't speak English. So he turned to Avram, and whatever Avram told him, he said, what's your name? Well, Avram's name was Weinberg. Okay, your name is Weinberg. And that's how we became Weinberg. Again, I, uh, I asked my mother a number of times. She told me the name in Russian, which I don't remember, unfortunately, but it was probably unpronounceable. So that's how we got to be Weinberg. The first memory I have was Natchez, uh, the home in South Washington Avenue. My grandmother and grandfather, uh, it was a double house. And you had to go upstairs the second floor and there was a door that just opened and I was in my grandmother's house. And I remember always go, climbing up the steps, going to my grandmother's house. Also, my father's place of business of course, was outside, and it was about a half a block square. And I remember climbing up in the barrels and getting in all kinds of trouble. I remember my favorite in the house. We had a big, big table in the dining room. And I remember we had. Uh, eight or 10 chairs, because it was a big family. But it seems if my pastime when I was a kid was climbing in and out, just, I guess, making a nuisance myself. <laughs> yeah. Right on top of the hill here, mm -hmm. Bear Taylor. Uh, I went there, they had the first sixth grade, kindergarten sixth grade. Then I went, that was uh, 35. Then I went down on uh, Quincy Avenue, 33, eighth grade, then graduated Central. I started, that was in 1940, I graduated Central. That summer, I went to Philadelphia to work for the Immigration and Naturalization Party. 
uh, in Immigration Naturalization on North Broad Street, and I started Temple University. I think I went there, oh, I don't even think I missed, finished the semester when I was drafted into the Air Corps. Now the reason I say Air Corps, it's the Air Force now, but 1941 was part of the Signal Corps of the United States Army. So uh, I went there and I got out in 1946. 1946, I came back, went to the university. And then I started working. Uh, my first job was with IBM accounting machines. That's the forerunner of the computer. And that's all I did all my life. I retired in um, 1968, I think it was. I went back to uh, Lackawanna College, graduated there, then went back to the University of Scranton, got another degree after I retired. And then I've been a bum since. <laughs> I just, uh, as I said, the last time I worked, I think it was 1968. What did I do in the Army? Okay. First, I went to Fort Indian Town Gap from Scranton. Got my uniform. Then I went down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, took my basic training. From Fort Bragg, they sent me to Fort Smith, I believe it was, right outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. From there, I went to Wilmington, North Carolina, for final training. And then I went to Birmingham, Alabama, 2nd Air Corps. From there, I went to San Francisco and went overseas to Australia. And then I went all the way through the islands going up to the Philippines as they were conquered. The war was over while I was still in the Philippines. And I made the biggest mistake of my life when I was asked to go to Japan. And I said, no, I had enough. The reason for that, in 1966, I was working for the state, the Department of Transportation, PennDOT, as a system analyst, because that was what I took in school, and that's all I did, same thing in the Army. My boss was a former commander, a woman, on General MacArthur's staff as an interpreter of Japanese. Uh, she graduated she was a graduate, I should say, of Smith College in New York. But she told me that the people of Japan, the common, she never in her life saw people so nice, kind, friendly, courteous. And her two years that she said, under MacArthur in Japan, she sees something and admire it. Oh, what's that you're holding? She admired it. They gave it to her. And if you didn't take it, they were very, very upset. So after I heard about it, of course, the reason I didn't want to go to Japan 
When I was in Manila in the Philippines, I saw what they did on Corregidor. I saw the dead bodies, the floating in water and just on the wayside. It was very disturbing, very disturbing. And I just assumed that the people were the same way. But she said it was a difference like day and night. I did tell you my boss woman went yeah. to uh, Japan. Yeah. She taught me with just normal conversation when she wanted to say something in an office which you know is wide open. Yeah. She would speak Japanese to me. She learned I learned certain phrases and sentences. Okay, and everybody knew, what she say? What she say? What Somebody had to keep track. Uh, I happened to be uh, assigned to the officer's section. Somebody had to keep track of where they were, what they were doing. And that's what they did, basically. David was in the Navy. He had an aircraft carrier shot out from under him. Uh, my brother Harry was drafted and deferred because he was the only one with family at that time. I think he had two children by that time. My brother Monroe was in the Air Service Command and he had just about the best job in the world. He took his basic training in Miami Beach, and from there, he was transferred to One Park Avenue, New York City during the war. Spent a, a whole war. After the war was over, this was 1945, I guess, war in Europe was over, I should say. They're bringing the troops home. So he went from One Park Avenue to Santa Tomas, Tomas and the Azores, which was a resort area, but coincidentally they had a airfield there. The plane stopped there, and he had to make sure everything, whatever he did, and then they came over to the United States. He tells the story, <clears throat> the Purple Heart, Normally, you get a Purple Heart if you're wounded in battle. And the story he told, he was in the chow line, waiting for his supper or lunch or breakfast, whatever, and somebody pushed him and he fell. And he scraped his elbow. As a joke, his comrades put him in for a purple heart, and he got it. <laughs> it's, it's funny. And he comes home with a purple heart, and he's the only one that wasn't in combat. <laughs> yes, thank God. Oh, my big brother, uh, Henry, um, he was the only one that didn't go overseas. He was in the States all the time. He was in the tanks, I believe, down in um, where the U.S. Treasury has a big mint, Fort Knox. He was down in Fort Knox. He was stationed there. Helen was an air raid warden. She had a white tin hat. And they gave her colonel's wings because that was what their insignia or whatever. And she told me she just walked up and down North Irving Avenue for whatever, an hour or so, every other night or something, which, of course, was useless. But 
they gave her something to do. My mother was always a homemaker. She was always home, of course. When my mother was alive, we were all strictly Orthodox. When my brother Harry uh, got married, uh, Jean was reformed, her family. So he turned to reform. Uh, my brother Henry was Orthodox. Davy and Mildred were conservative. And I was Orthodox, which I still am today. Although today, I guess you would call it a modern Orthodoxy. Uh, my mother's life no such thing as television on or radio on. The Sabbath was day of rest, period. Uh, we had, back in those days, a coal stove that she would bank on Friday so to be all day, keep the food warm on Saturday because you didn't put the t stove on on Saturday. Everything was warmed overnight. Um, went to synagogue well, I, until I came here. I'd go every morning. I, I remember the last few years of her life uh, when she couldn't see, I used to read the Bible to her in Hebrew because she did that all her life herself so just to keep up the whole family on both sides came from the teen that's the um, the teen is a city the county was Basarabia and the state, as I said, was either Romania or Russia, depending on who won the battle. My grandmother came over in 1920. I was born in 1922. But uh, every Saturday, my grandmother <clears throat> lived on South Washington Avenue behind a bakery, and uh, I remember that. When the flood came, which was uh, back in those days, every spring, just about every spring, I see the lower flats were flooded. From there, she moved to First Avenue, which is no longer, because they made a ball field out of it. It was just flooded too often, and uh, the hurricane in the 50s, I believe it was, was it Diane or, or I don't remember what Agnes? Or Agnes or whatever. Yeah. Back in the 50s when the flats was devastated. Um, that's when my uh, grandfather moved up with his son, Morris Goodman. And uh, my grandmother died, I believe, in 1942 or something like that. Yeah, my mother took the cows that one of the kids have it. I don't know who took them. When I decided to move here, or I should say when it was decided for me, but the, kids, the kids took everything, and I don't know you what don't, you went don't to You don't know who has them? No. no. Somebody has them. Well, it was about this high. It was about a foot and a half high. And it had uh, five wicks. My father passed away in November 1945. Uh, I was still overseas in the Philippines. In fact, I was in Manila at that time. And uh, they didn't tell me until I got home in February of 46. 
And my Uncle Morris met me at the, that time, the Laurel Line was still running when I came in from what is, Fort Meade, Virginia. That's where I was discharged. Took the train, train up to uh, Wilkes-Barre and took the Lower Line in. And he met me at the station. This was like four o'clock in the morning. And that's what he told me my, about my father. But, I really don't remember. Naturally, I was upset. And um, I hadn't seen my father since 1941. Things fade. Now, thank God, I was the last one to come home from the service. All the rest of them had enough, uh, at that point, you needed points. And uh, I only had two and a half years overseas, so I didn't have enough points, I guess. Helen, normal sister. The only thing that happened to her she fell out of the second story window. She was cleaning them and bent over and she fell down. And from what, when she passed away, the doctor said something was ripped open and she was bleeding internally. And that's what she passed away from when she died. I think 1992. All I know is that right before my mother died, we were supposed to go to Israel, the three of us. And just Helen and I went, and we used to go just about every other year until I would say 19, late 1980s. The first time, we went because it was the state of Israel, supposedly the homeland of Jewish people. I liked it because it was just like, instead of going out to California, going to Nevada, we said, let's go to Israel. No special reason. But I saw the country, I liked it. I like the people. Um, language was no barrier. Uh, but like any other vacation, everything we saw was good. In all the times I've been there, <clears throat> other than seeing everybody, the Israelis I'm referring to, carrying guns. I never saw any arrest or riot or anything like that. And we traveled all over, all over. Went to Hebrew school until I was 13 and became bar mitzvah. And then I was a man, I didn't have to go. <laughs> No, it's a different type of Hebrew. It's similar, but different. Just like German and Yiddish. It's the same, but it's different. I understand German, although I don't speak it. Oh yeah, my mother, grandma, grandparents. When I was a kid, uh, I used to speak Yiddish to my grandparents, or my mother, although she encouraged us to 
Speak English, speak English. Lackawanna College, uh, more or less mathematics, which was very interesting. At the university, just stud general studies, because I knew I wasn't going to work anymore. I had nothing to do. And something my mother always encouraged, just get an education, get an education. So I said, what am I going to do with two college degrees? <laughs> and I said, just uh, enjoyed myself. I graduated Lackawanna College, uh, magna cum laude, and, and um, the university I was on Dean's list. I really didn't have a major. I just took dental studies. I really didn't. When I back in the forties, or I said, yeah, you know, I wanted to go to. Uh, be an architect, but because of the influx of all the students who were, I guess, better prepared than I was or anything, I couldn't get an architectural school. There's two puzzles, the cryptogram, everything in the paper. I work those. I do a lot of reading. A lot of reading, and uh, while waiting, you watch television. I'm, unfortunately, I can't hear what they're talking about. That's why I have the closed caption. And the same thing with the phone. I'm waiting for a new phone. <clears throat> new phone that it has closed caption. When you call. It, whatever you send, I'm there so I can go back. I can talk on the phone. Well, Florida it was a set routine golf in the morning, every uh, just Monday to Friday. Saturday and Sunday, I never go. The reason for that, the courses were just jammed. Even though I was in a private course. And uh, have lunch with the fellows I played golf. Come back, take a shower, take a nap, go out for supper, and many, many good restaurants in Florida. Go over to Clubhouse. Uh, on, let's see, Tuesday night, we always played pool. Wednesday night, we played cards. Thursday, they had a movie right there. Uh, Friday night I went to the synagogue. Saturday I went to the synagogue. Sunday I just washed my clothes, cleaned the house. And that's about it, but it was a routine. Golf, eat lunch, sleep, eat supper. That's it. I never gave it a thought. I it was just there. The family was there. For Good, bad, we always seem to get together. Even in Florida, we had a cousins club. All the cousins uh, eventually moved down, like from New York, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and uh, we always get together at least once a month. We'd have like, a, uh, uh, normally we got together for a brunch at one of the country clubs down there. And just kibitz, to find out what, what everybody's doing, so on and so forth, kids. And 
That's about it. Just chalk. We'd be upset, or I should say my mother would be upset, or my sister would be upset, if one of the cousins couldn't come. If there was a family reunion, it was unthinkable, literally unthinkable, not to go. And like I said, I remember uh, sleeping in my aunt's house on the floor or on the couch. Uh, nobody stayed in the hotel, and just about everybody was there. I remember every year uh, we'd have a family reunion where everybody was there, the kids, grandkids, everything, up at Chapman's Lake or someplace else, whatever they decided. My uncle had a cottage up at Chapman's Lake and uh, my brother had a cottage up there. And my brother Harry had a uh, house down on Long Beach Island. And uh, he would rent the next door house. And we'd all come down there and stay on the beach for a couple of days or a long weekend. Just uh, somebody would call up each other and let's meet here, let's meet there. And that's happening today also. So you've only moved here very recently. Here? Yeah. Yeah, in July. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Yeah. I, uh, the people are extremely friendly, don't get me wrong. It's, uh, it's a different life. They have so many things to do here. And like, it was the only reason I fight with Mildred. Mildred, I don't want to go. You got to go, you got to go. I mean, I'd rather read a good book or something like that than go there. And I believe I have a handicap and that I can't hear too well. And of course, that makes me a little reluctant to be with a group. But there's a misconception with hearing aids. I got this, the hearing aids, um, I should say, when I was in the South Pacific, when I was in New Guinea in South Pacific, I had a a nerve loss infection. And uh, that's where I lost my hearing down there. Wow. And then when it went through the islands, this got progressively bad. I have, I t if I take my hearing aids out, absolutely no sound. I can't hear my own voice. At least, with the hearing aids in, it gives me that somebody's talking to me, so naturally I turn to them. And when they talk like this, I tell them, please take your hand away. Because I, I guess unconsciously I read lips. Back in, in the 527th or 30, I had various alarms I don't have here, I'll have to get them. Like, for instance, the telephone rang, light would flash. Somebody knocked on the door, light would flash. The day was born in December of 1920. I was born in April of 22. So that's 13 months, so it's like 14 months. Close, yes, in a sense, but not really. He went his way, I went mine. We had, growing up, we had mutual friends. We went out and grouped together. But then after he got married, he came back with a different life. As I said, uh, my dad had a big yard Although I didn't have my license, or David did not have a license, used to drive 
in the barrel yard, inside, it was a half a block square. Uh, drive the truck, drive a car, never on the street. Uh, when I turned 16, I remember my dad taking me up to the state police. I got my license. Uh, and because I was living in, in David, and whoever got the car first, <laughs> it was a fight, but it wasn't. I mean, if they had a date, and he would have misunderstood. But I uh, always had a car all my life. And um, although I'm not wealthy and never had really wealthy, I always had a car, always went wherever I wanted to go, always bought whatever I wanted. I don't remember anything bad about my childhood. I remember some things while I was working, people I didn't get along with. I guess just normal life. No. Never? I was debating. I would say I got away with murder. I was always a little conservative, quiet. In the Army, one story, I was stationed at the time I believe Birmingham, Alabama, Second Air Force. And everybody took their turn with KP, which is Kitchen Police, or took guard duty. And I had taken guard duty And then I took my kitchen place, KP, but the captain's nephew, who I was serving, he was also there, and he had to go someplace, or he wanted off. Or, so the captain asked me, take the KP, and I said, no, I just took it. I don't know why or what, he assigned me to KP permanently, which he could do. In the meanwhile, the company went overseas to Europe. In fact, they went to Italy. I just, I found this out maybe a year later when I asked about the old company. <clears throat> They're in the Mount Casino area of Italy, and that area at that time was one of the fiercest fighting going on between the Germans and the Americans. Unfortunately, I mean, I was a little saddened when I heard it. The company was just about wiped out, killed. Maybe one or two survivors. And I don't know, I said, I looked up to the heavens, I said, thank you, I could have been over there. It was, I felt so bad. And this happened to me one or two other times, something that somebody saved me. This was after the war. Mr. Friedland, who lived two houses up from me, had a gas station on Vine and Penn. And not only was a friend, I grew up with his son, I always got my gas there. 
And when I came into a station, I used to kibitz with him and talk, stay there 10, 15 minutes. I don't know, that day I said, I gotta go, got my gas and I left. The story that was in the paper, five minutes later after I left, truck came barreling in where I was parked, killed him in the station and I was there. I don't know what made me leave. It happened another time. But... In Florida. Yeah. I made a, I was coming down Lake Worth Avenue, which is where I live. And I turned into a gas station. And as I was turning, this young girl came from another direction and totaled the car, my car, totally, completely. I just unstrapped my belt, opened up and she hit the passenger side, but completely, I mean, I, the car was demolished. They, they didn't fix it. Opened, my, opened the other door and walked out. Discipline. Following orders, I said seeing a job through before if I, if I start cutting the grass, if I finish it tomorrow, I'll finish it tomorrow. They, they gave you a job, you had to finish it. I think it made my eye a little more orderly, definitely. There wasn't anything bad When I was in the Philippines, <clears throat> I started down in Leyte and went all the way up through the Philippines. War all around me, I didn't really see anything. I remember sitting on the beach at night while the Battle of Leyte Gulf, that's they claimed was the turning point in the war that the Navy, the United States Navy won. Just watching the gun flash in the distance. But it might have been, again, as a task to General McCarthy's headquarters. And had the headquarters that where we lived in the barracks. Then they had an army battalion around. Then they had another battalion around that. And then they had the rangers on the third battalion. No way was anybody going to get through. I mean, I, I seemed protected while I was in the service. Nothing happened to me, it seemed. It seems as if, if I had to do anything special, I'd always call Harry. Coincidentally, Olive Street, yeah. going from the top down to Irving Avenue, when we were kids, they always, Close the fountain so you can use your sled and go down. And then when you got in the bottom between Irving and Prescott, they put sand down there and then you'd stop. <clears throat> and of course, I was small. I never went down myself. Harry, we always had a sled and Harry drove. 
or he steered it. And I'd just hang on to him. One year, we're coming down Olive Street. We get down to Irving, and then when you, you'd actually fly before you come down. For some reason or other, don't ask me what, we had a bare spot. Either the city didn't put enough snow there or whatever, whatever the reason. And we went flying. <laughs> <laughs> because that <laughs> actually flying off the thin <laughs> Fortunately, we didn't get hurt. It was a four star general, it was nothing unusual. But I should say five stars eventually. But uh, Truman let him know who was boss. He tried to go above Truman, Truman, out Truman, I know. He always took, from what I understand, always took credit, even though he shouldn't have at certain battles or everything, but he was an excellent tactician, no question about that, excellent. After I took my basic training, mm -hmm. and then they send you to various schools, I mean, this is the Army's way, uh, I went right overseas and spent, uh, like I said, over two and a half years in, overseas in the Pacific, going starting in Australia and then New Guinea, going through the islands and right up to the Pacific. It was a funny story. When I got drafted, I went to see Rabbi Gutterman, who at that time was the rabbi in Scranton, said, Rabbi, what am I going to do? I mean, what am I going to eat? Because up to that moment, I never ate in a restaurant. And to show you how narrow-minded I was, I'd look into the restaurant, and I'd say, how is he doing business? And I'm not so... <laughs> See how narrow my that is? I asked the rabbi, what should I do? And he said, you have to live, eat. We went to, as I said, uh, Indian Town Gap to get our uniforms before they ship you wherever you're going. That time I went from Indian Town Gap right to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And the captain or sergeant, I don't really recall who, said, in honor of your being in the service, we're going to serve a ham dinner. I never ate ham. I haven't eaten since. Coincidentally, if you recall now, this is 1940 or 42 rather, I'm sorry. Refrigeration was practically non-existent back then. The ham was tainted. I mean, just coincidence. Myself and maybe four or five of the other fellows ended up in the hospital. It was the only time I was in, no, I was in the hospital one other time in Alabama. <clears throat> so I looked up literally, <laughs> although I told them, I said, okay, you don't want me to eat it? <laughs> and that was the first and last time I ate ham. Mm.